Good morning. Go ahead and be seated. Open your Bibles to the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Now, as you know, I'm going to be in Thailand a week from today, two weeks from today, a fabulous fifth Sunday with baptisms and the Lord's Supper. That's always a wonderful time. And then the first Sunday in August, as your eyes kind of follow down here in Luke chapter 3 to see where we're going to go, you ask for it, you get it. We're going to talk about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? For those of you who've always wondered why those things are in the Bible, that's going to be our focus on the first Sunday in August. But this morning, we're going to look at verses 21 and 22. And as you kind of locate yourself in Luke chapter 3, let me just pause a minute to say, wow, when we talk about a summer to share, We really had no idea when we began to talk about this that it was going to be so significant. Uh, We were able to, by the grace of God, see 30,000 food items collected, and now we're into the second phase of that project. But at the same time, we have been sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we have been sharing our people. I think this really all began in May with the ordination of Ron Haley. I think many of you remember that. And since then, we have seen teams from Graceway go out just about every week this summer. Uh, We just had our team from Taiwan get back yesterday, uh, having been there teaching English as a second language. And uh, we have prayed for teams leaving for China uh, tomorrow or Tuesday, I guess that is. And the Greens, of course, will be on that team that will be staying there indefinitely, working with the Hoffmans in Baotou, China. And uh, then tomorrow, we have a team leaving for Egypt, and Kalina Antman will be staying in that part of the world, going from Egypt to the West Bank, uh, to the Jericho area. She'll be spending the next year of her life there. We've got the team that will be leaving tomorrow for Mexico, and then we'll have those of us going to Thailand that will be leaving Wednesday, and we've still got a team leaving for India that we'll pray for next week. I mean, it's just been like that all week long. We've welcomed a new staff member and now sending Alan and Delana to Blue Springs. So there's been a local focus and there's been a global focus. And uh, wow, what, a, what an amazing time. And for some of these people, the beginning of a new era, a new season of their lives for the Greens and for Kalina and for Alan and Delana, uh, uh, absolutely the beginning of a new time of ministry for them. But don't forget this, it's also a time of fruit from seed that has been sown for a long time. And that's very, very important. People and churches go through cycles. We go through growth spurts. And uh, wow, this has just been a real summer for sharing in so many senses of the word. And so we rejoice in that. But it's also what we're going to see this morning in Luke chapter 3, the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus Christ. I believe there's a pattern here. I believe that there are principles here that apply to all of us as our lives continually cycle through new eras and new beginnings. Now, there's only one sentence that we're going to look at this morning, so let's read it, beginning in verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Now, as I just said, the baptism of Jesus by John the baptizer marks the beginning of a new era. In verse 21, we see exactly what happens. Jesus is baptized, and he becomes one with us. He identifies with us. Or as John put it in chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Quite literally, the Word tabernacled among us. Or we might say today, He pitched His tent among us. He became one with us. In Matthew, you remember we have a little bit more information, and John the baptizer says to Jesus, are are you sure you're in the right line? 
I'm supposed to baptize you. I mean, you, you ought to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, it's supposed to be just like this in order that we fulfill all righteousness. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm being baptized because it's the right thing to do. Very important. Now, let me kind of theologically explain why this is so significant. Very important that we get this. Our God is not a God who is inaccessible behind some cosmic screen. What is unique about the Christian faith is our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ, is not a cosmic figure out there somewhere who's saying, catch me if you can. Work your way to find me if you can. He came to earth to become one of us, accessible, as one who understands us, as the book of Hebrews says, one who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He understands our pain, our sorrow, our frustrations, our temptations. He gets it because he came to be one of us. Now think about this. We've been studying the book of Luke since January. And if this were a movie, we've seen the, the movie writers, we've seen them put in all the necessary background information and flashbacks and, and, and whatnot. And, and now for the first time, the star comes onto the screen. And when he does, it's not as some inaccessible distant God. But when Jesus comes onto the scene, he's baptized by John the baptizer to identify himself with us. One sentence, three infinitive phrases, the heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit descended, a voice comes from heaven. And notice when it happens. It happens not necessarily at the moment of his baptism, because it says here in verse 21, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heavens were opened. Now, does that mean he's still in the water? Has he gone up onto the shore? Is this some time afterwards? We're not really told. What we are told, however, is that the key to this is Jesus praying. And this is another one of the key themes of the Gospel of Luke. We've seen Luke's propensity to elevate the status of women. We have seen Luke's theme to help us understand the universality of the good news of Jesus Christ, that it is for all the peoples of the world. And another key emphasis in Luke's gospel is the emphasis on prayer. And we're going to see this over and over. At critical moments in Jesus' life and ministry, Luke is going to be very careful to remind us that Jesus is praying. And it's the fact of prayer that Luke emphasizes, not the methodology of prayer, not the details of prayer. Sometimes when people ask me questions about prayer, some of the questions I have about prayer usually have to do with methodology. And Luke's not concerned about that. Luke is concerned with the fact of prayer. And it's not how long Jesus prayed or how short Jesus prayed, or how intensely Jesus prayed, or whether he cried when he prayed, whether he spoke with a loud voice or a soft voice, or what position his body was in when he prayed, but rather the fact that he prayed. That's the important thing. And sometimes we want to emphasize the other stuff. I've said this, and I'm sure you have too. Oh, I love it when so-and-so prays because, wow, when so-and-so prays, wow, you can just feel that connection with heaven. Now, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I understand what you're saying because I say the same thing. But are we praying for our own benefit? Or are we concerned whether we're making contact with God? And, and honestly, sometimes we pray in such a way that I, I think we're more impressed than God is. Oh, great God! of heaven, Father of lights, how we adore thee. And kind of get the, you know, goosebumps and all that type of stuff like, whoa, oh, they really got a hold of God. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think God is that impressed. He is more impressed that we are in contact with him. 
And you know how it is in a big family where, you know, the older kids are articulate and they can kind of make their case like a good lawyer. And then you've got the little kids, you know, maybe three and four years old. You can't even hardly understand them. And, and you have to listen real carefully to what, they, what they're saying. And, but does that mean that what they're saying is any less important than what the 18-year-old is saying? No, I think that they're both as important in the parent's eyes as the other. And that's kind of like prayer. It's not the methodology or the words that we use. It's the fact that we are in contact with God. And the Bible says here in Luke 3 that the heaven was opened. Isn't that cool? You ever, you ever feel like you pray and heaven is closed? <laughs> well, I know that feeling too. The heaven was opened. But you know what is so important about this? Here's another little the theological insight. You, you know how I've been telling you all along that Luke is very careful to use literary devices that help an oral audience, one who does not read or write, to understand what he's saying. And we've talked about things like inclusios where you make a statement in the beginning and then you make a parallel statement in the end that helps you piece together the continuity and what is going on. So, so get this, Jesus opens his public ministry by being baptized by John the Baptist and the heaven is opened. Jesus closes his public ministry when he dies on the cross. And we won't take the time to look this up, but if you were to look this up at the very end of the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 45, when Jesus dies on the cross at that very instant, Luke says, in the temple, the veil that separated the people from the Holy of Holies where God's glory was, was ripped from top to bottom. Not us working our way, but from top to bottom, an act of God's grace, the veil in the temple is split open. And what that means is you and I now have access to God. The book of Hebrews talks about that in Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. It reminds us that that second veil, there was a veil that people would come into the temple behind. And, and, that, and that first area is where the furniture of the temple was, but there was a second internal veil that covered the place that is called in Hebrews the holiest place. We commonly refer to that as the Holy of Holies. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God's presence resided here on earth. And no one, not even the priest, could go behind that veil, except for the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer the sacrifice for the sin of the nation of Israel. And so the image was there's a barrier. That barrier, of course, is sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, that veil is ripped open. And that's why Hebrews 10 says, we now have, by the blood of Jesus Christ, direct access. And in a very real sense, now heaven is open to all of us. And that's the message. Jesus began his ministry that way. He finished his ministry that way. And because of that, we no longer have to depend upon our emotions and feelings. You ever feel like heaven is closed when you're praying? Yeah, I feel like that a lot of times. But you know what? It doesn't depend upon how we feel or how loud or intense our prayers may be. I'm going to really, really, really pray, and I'm going to pray for five hours, and then God will have to do something. Well, no, not necessarily, because he's God. You don't make him do anything. But now heaven is open, and we have free access, whether we feel like it or not. That's the message. That's, that's the incredible privilege that we have. And what this means also is that the image of Jesus' ministry is set because from this point on, the emphasis is on Jesus, not John. In fact, isn't it interesting that in this passage, Luke chooses to not even mention John's name? Because from this point on, Jesus is in the driver's seat. And the emphasis of this sentence that we just read in verses 21 and 22 is not as much on the physical baptism of Jesus, but on what that provokes. It provokes the confirming witness of God the Father 
and God the Spirit, that God the Son is among us, and that this Jesus, the adopted son of Joseph the carpenter of Nazareth, is in fact the Son of God. That's the point of the passage to confirm who he is. And right here in this one sentence, the Trinity comes into focus. One God in three persons. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's a word that is used by theologians and Bible scholars throughout the centuries to speak of the triunity, Trinity, of God. One God, three persons. You say, Jeff, explain the Trinity. I can't. We can understand what God is, even though we cannot understand necessarily why he is the three in one. One of the great doctrines of the Christian church for these last 2,000 years, and you'll find it in every major creed and statement of faith. You'll find it in, in churches, statements of faith on the internet, from Methodist churches to Presbyterian churches and Baptist churches and independent churches and on and on and on. We believe in the Trinity, one God, three persons. One of the earliest heresies in the church of Jesus Christ was to not believe in the Trinity. There was a period of time where there was a theology that we call today modalism, M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M from mode, believing that God is not a Trinity, he just appears in three different modes. And classically, the argument goes like this. In the Old Testament, God was the Father. And then he stopped being the Father to become the Son. And then after the day of Pentecost, he stopped being the Son to be the Spirit. That's called modalism, one God, three modes. So at one time he was the Father, at one time he revealed himself as the Son, and now he reveals himself as a Spirit. Now there, there, there are still modalists in the world today. You need to be aware of this. You need to know this. There's a couple of significant groups, the largest of which is the United Pentecostal Church. I have some very good friends in the United Pentecostal Church, but that's why they baptize in the name of Jesus only and not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of the greatest proponents of that and representatives of that group is Bishop T.D. Jakes of Dallas. Wonderful man, does a lot of amazing things in the city of Dallas. This is not a criticism of him as an individual, but just simply to let you know this is the theology that is represented, and it's one that has been resoundly debated and condemned in the church as heresy for the past 2,000 years. But this passage is one of the keys as to why personally I reject that because in this one sentence you see all of the three persons of God how he is one God who exists in three persons you see the son of God being baptized you see the spirit of God descending upon him in bodily form notice that Luke says that he wants us to understand that they both exist at the same time this is not a pass off there is a physical Son of God in the Jordan River. There is a physical Spirit of God coming down from heaven and the voice of the Father from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. They're all there in the same sentence. Now, I can illustrate that. I can say I'm one person, but I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a husband. Okay, I can illustrate it, but let's be very honest. I can't totally explain it. At some point, that illustration breaks down because it's a human illustration and it's a very poor way to understand what it means that God is, is one person or, or one God, but, but three persons, Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. I don't understand that. My wife and I were uh, spending some time a couple of weeks ago with a lady who is Jewish who came to faith in Christ years ago. She's a wonderful Bible teacher, and she was telling us that as a girl, and of course the, the, the Jews are so heavy on there. there is one God, the Shema, uh, that they take from the book of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And those Christians, they're, they're heretics because they believe in three gods. No, we believe in one God in three persons. And she can say, I remember when I was a little girl in the synagogue saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, why does it say in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image? And, and Rabbi, Rabbi, why does it say in Genesis 3.22, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil? Be quiet, little girl. The Lord our God is one God. 
Oh, yes, we believe that too. The Lord our God is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the, 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 the Son. And I think one of the reasons for that, would you look in John chapter 17, very important passage of Scripture. This is when Jesus, the Son, is praying to the Father in the power of the Spirit right before he is delivered to be crucified. And he's praying for us. And it says in John chapter 17, verse 20, Nevertheless, pray I for, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now here's what's so significant about that. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who have existed always. One God, three persons, in perfect unity, loving each other. One God. You know what that means? He doesn't need us. When God looks for an object of love, he has to look no further than what we call in theology the Godhead. He doesn't need us. He's complete without us. But for whatever reason, he made us. He loved us. When we sinned, he sent his son to die for us that we might be one with him. Very important for us to understand. I'm not going to explain the Trinity to your satisfaction or mine this morning, but I just want you to understand the significance of having the entire Trinity in view right here in Luke chapter 3. And we'll come back and see other examples of that as we make our way through the book of Luke. But this is the time when Jesus is anointed for ministry. This is what is really happening here. Jesus, the Son of God, is anointed with God the Spirit in order that his ministry might be done in the power of God alone. And he interprets it that way himself in chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He begins quoting from the book of Isaiah as he speaks this morning in the synagogue in, in Nazareth, his hometown. And if you go to the book of Acts chapter 10, these are the words of Peter when he's in the home of Cornelius. And Peter is preaching here in verse 36. He says, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So what we're seeing here, this is the the moment that begins the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as he is anointed with God's Spirit for this ministry, and he is identified as the promised Son of God, thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It reminds us of the second psalm. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago, Psalm 2, verse 7, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And so there's all types of echoes here. It's also an echo of what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1, where he said, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And that, of course, leads into those passages in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, where the Messiah is presented presented to us as the suffering servant, the lamb that was led to the slaughter, on whose self God had put our sin that he might die in our place for us. And it's also an echo of Genesis, where the voice of God the Father comes to him and says, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Does that remind you of something in Genesis? God spoke and he created the heavens and the earth. And in verse 31, 
God said, it is very good. You know what's happening here? It's the dawning of a new creation. Jesus appears. He's anointed with the Spirit. And the Father says, this is very good. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's the dawning of a new day of creation. You and I, that's why we have the ability to be a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus when we put our faith in him. So, wow, what an amazing, and you know what? This is one of the distinguishing features of our faith. Our God has a son. There's no other faith that can say that. Our God had a son so that you and I can be sons and daughters of God through him. Not inaccessible, not behind a cosmic shield, not come and find me if you can, work hard and maybe you'll get here, but rather a God who says, I'm going to be born among you so that you can know me and so that I can offer my life as a sacrifice for the penalty of your sin. That's what it means to know him. That's our faith. You know, one of the most radical things that Jesus did, a lot of people don't realize this, but from the very beginning, Jesus is going to begin to talk about my father, my father, my father, my father in heaven. Do you realize that you can read through the Old Testament and not see that? Abraham doesn't talk about God as his father, nor does Moses, nor does Noah, nor does Daniel, nor does Isaiah, nor does David. None of them do. When Jesus began to talk about God as my father, that radically changed the world. And because he is God's son, it is now possible for us to pray as he taught us to pray our Father, which art in heaven. You see how significant that is? We read the Bible casually and sometimes carelessly, and we don't pick up on those things and realize this is huge stuff. And that's why we're taking our time going through the book of Luke, because there is just so much that we take for granted. How many times do you hear somebody talk about, yeah, yeah, God our Father, you know, our Daddy in the heaven and all that type of thing. We, 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 we just don't realize nobody has ever been able to say that until now because of Jesus, the Son of God. It's so important for us to understand the importance of the Trinity, remission of sins, baptism, repentance, all these theological concepts we've spoken of for the last several weeks. Are, are they deep and complex? Yeah. Can you understand it? Yeah, I think you can. Will you have to put forth a little bit of effort? You might, but it's important. This is the book that God has given to us. That's why it's important that we read it, that we not just listen when we come to church once or twice a month, but that we are in this book on a daily basis. It is the guide that God has given to us. And this passage then serves as a model for our very own anointing for service. Our baptism is also Trinitarian, to use a big theological word. Because according to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, we are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when Jesus was baptized, he was identifying with us. And the Father and the Spirit were identifying with him and saying, he's the one, this is the Son in whom I'm well pleased. And when we are baptized, it's we are saying the same thing in the other direction. This is my God in whom I am well pleased. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's more than just a ritual and a ceremony. It's more than just getting dunked in water. It is a proclamation that we are pleased in him and that we identify with him. I've been hammering on that the last couple of weeks, and, and several of you have said, I think it's about time for me to follow 
in baptism and, and do this. So it's going to be exciting to see what happens two weeks from today when we uh, have a time of baptism. If you'd like to get in on it, there's still time to do it. You can call the office or probably the easiest things, take the card, circle the B for baptism, put your contact information, give it to somebody at the counter or out there, the VIG counter, and just say, hey, make sure this gets to the right place, and they will, and we'll call you and tell you what you got to do. It's, it's, it's not hard at all, but it is important. We declare the work of Christ to be effective in our life. Now, this is a time when we are anointed for our service. You know what Jesus said in John 20 and verse 21? As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. So how should our ministry begin? I would imagine in the same way. By us being baptized, identifying with him, proclaiming, this is my Father in whom I'm well pleased. As we declare that we have received the Spirit of God from heaven, anointing us for service. And that's exactly what he told us. Luke chapter 24, at the very end of the story, verse 46, Jesus says unto them, Thus it is written, thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, that would be the Holy Spirit, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. There's that whole Trinitarian influence again. God the Father sends the Son who says, now I'm sending you as my Father has sent me. Go and wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with the power of God the Spirit, and then you will be witnesses of me. So Jesus is anointed for his public ministry. We see this at the end of Luke as well. This is the transition to volume 2, which is the book of Acts, also written by Dr. Luke. That's how it begins. So Jesus is anointed for his public ministry. What's yours? God's desire is to anoint you for your ministry. No, I'm not saying you have to be a preacher or a missionary or go live in Palestine or, or China. No, 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 no. What's your ministry? Where do you serve? You're, you're not one of those professing Christians just kind of shows up every now and then and fills a seat, are you? You're not one of those. Surely not. What is your ministry? God has anointed you for that. And, and, and before you say, well, my, my ministry is my kids, do they know that? Anybody else know that? You know, it's easy how we can make all these little excuses to say, yeah, this, this is what I do. We live to please God. I love it when the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Can God say that about us? Let, let, me, let me break that application down just a little bit further because this is so important. I always believe that there are three things that parents need to say to their children, and they need to say them frequently. The first one is this, I love you. The Father said, this is the Son that I love. How big is that? My father-in-law was a, was a good guy. He was a believer and all that. But ask my wife about it sometimes. She, never, she was in her 30s when she heard her father say for the first time, I love you. Ask her about how that affected her growing up and how that has affected her as a grown woman, wanting so badly to hear her dad say, I love you. I have a young lady been living with us for the last month who is from a, a Central Asian background, and uh, she's told me the same thing. She said, you know, I, 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 our, our family, we really love each other, but I've, I've never once heard my dad say, I love you. Is that really hard? <clears throat> to be able to say to your child or your grandchild, I love you. I can't tell you how many kids I talk to who go into rebellion just trying to get the attention of mom and dad. Hello, I'm here. We need to hear something like, I love you. And here's the second thing, I'm really proud of you. 
in whom I'm well pleased. Wow. I told that to a young woman in Costa Rica a few years ago. I said, you know what? I'm really proud of you because of X, Y, and Z. And she began to cry. She said, I can't tell you how long it's been since somebody told me that. She was looking at me as a father figure in her life, and it was just overwhelming to her to hear someone as a father figure say, I'm proud of you. Maybe that's why your kids do things that you're not proud of, because you've never told them that you are. And the third thing you need to tell your kids, you're really good at fill in the blank. Be specific about it. You're really good at whatever it may be. Whether that's video games or what. You can sit, I'm, I'm dead serious. You can sit around like some old grouch and, and just be continually against everything, or you can say, you know what, I don't understand video games, but you're really good at them. The father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You know, we, we see this pattern, this, this time of new beginning cycle through our lives. We talked about Ron Haley's new beginning as, as Reverend Ron, even though he's been around in this church for a long time. And we've, we've talked about the teams that we've sent out almost every week this summer. We've talked about some of those that will not be coming back, the Greens and, and uh, uh, Kalina and, 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 and others. And it's just uh, exciting to see that. And uh, we, we've talked about Alan and Delana this morning going to Blue Springs, which just kind of came up in a God thing. And it was just... It just what a, what a wonderful thing that is, but consider that what we have in this one sentence in Luke chapter 3 ought to be a model for all of us. Common steps of obedience and faithfulness and the power of God's grace, oneness together with the triune God and other believers, being anointed by God's Spirit for service. Where are you in that process? What steps do you need to take? How can we help you get there? Father, we pray this morning 